And I'm asked about this thing all the time, by the way. So this is the steak base. Um, there were two. There was one before this that was made on a Japanese uh, jazz bass special that my mother bought for me at Don Strock Music down in Colonial Heights. I think it was Don Strock. It was one of the Don. Um, and Chuck Varga, the executioner, he painted a steak on it. You know, but the thing is that like, I mean, the whole deal with even why, how I wound up playing a Steinberger, right? Like with the steak base, it kept getting, um, the input jack would get ripped all the way out of the base because people were running around and we didn't have wireless back then. So like, you know, they're like the cables or just grab a hold of uh, somebody's chains or armor or whatever, you know, and the tuning pegs would get caught in somebody's chains. And so it would get pulled, like it got pulled all the way out of my hands, like a few times, right? Like eventually we got wireless, so that sort of solved that problem. But the main issue for me was uh, getting knocked out of tune and getting the bass pulled out of my hands. So that's how I wound up with a Steinberger. I'm a different bass player playing this bass than any other bass because it's just so easy to play, right? It's got like the string spacing. Um, it's a long scale bass, but it plays like a short scale. It's a uh, an incredible piece of engineering, um, you know, and it has its flaws. I mean, like I, you know, this bridge right here, this is at least the sixth bridge that's been on this thing. You know, I have to replace the bridge a lot. And it got to the point where I was trying to find, like I had tracked down a semi truck that had a bunch of Steinberger parts in it that was just sitting there. And like you could, uh, there was a sketchy dude named Ed Roman from Las Vegas, from your town. You know, he's he's a weird dude. He used to be A and R guy for uh, for Steinberger and for uh, Gibson, and you know, so you kind of had to go to Ed Roman to get this stuff. So anyway, long story short, uh, that's one of the things I don't like about this bass. But there's plenty of things that I do like. Um, when I started playing the Steinberger. I didn't want them to paint it because I liked it a lot. You know, I, I, I've got this off of the wall at Guitar Center in San Francisco. And it was sitting there and like I had never seen one. Uh, I mean, well, I had seen one. The only person I knew who played one was um, Robbie Shakespeare, <laughs> who played for like Black Uhuru and shit. Like he's a reggae bass player, you know, and that's who played them back then was like, reggae bass players and uh, funk bass players and shit like that. I liked it because it had the same pickup configuration that I was used to and it didn't have any freaking tuning pegs. So it wasn't gonna get ripped out of my hands. And it's weird too, because it's an old one and it was old when I bought it. It had been sitting there in that music store for at least five or six years, right? This bass was made at the original Steinberger factory in the uh, early 80s. When I bought it, it cost me $800, which seemed like a lot of money at the time. But, you know, I, I didn't want to mess it up. So I got like, you know, at the time, Gore had a manager who was a seamstress. Her name was Liz Fairbairn. She was a, a good lady. She was a toy maker and a seamstress by trade. And she made sort of stuffed animals. And then she started doing production work. She worked for Neil Young, um, worked for uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Liz became the manager of Guar. She moved out uh, to Richmond. And this was one of the earliest things she did for us was she sewed this version of the steak base so that I could put it on as a cover and then take it off. So people ask me about the steak base all the time. It's a cover, right? And you can see that it's just nothing but vinyl and it's in terrible shape right now because it's, you know, like 30, I mean, 88 is when this was made, probably. So it's an old piece of, uh, of kit, man. And it's, you know, it went on with kind of Velcro and uh, uh, it's stuffed right there, you know, and, and the, the, it's molded perfectly to the shape of the base. It's pretty ingenious, really. And you could tune it right there. And I didn't have to have a bunch of stupid stuff, you know, hanging off the base. It still sucked. Like it sucks playing bass with this thing on it, you know, but I did it because it was cool and it's worth it to be cool, especially in Guar. And this, by the way, is the guitar that I played on Live from Antarctica. 
It's the guitar that I played on uh, every Guar album. I think the first album where I tracked using it was America Must Be Destroyed. And then it was on America Must Be Destroyed. It was on This Toilet Earth. It was on a bunch of the live EPs. And then it was on We Kill Everything. And it has been on the two most recent Guar albums made after the death of Dave Brockie. Uh, the Blood of Gods and New Dark Ages. You get a lot of tonal control, and it's funny because I always, you know, like bass players do this, I think. They like having tonal control, but then you set it one way and just leave it the fuck like that. Because, <laughs> because you know, I like to know that I could make it sound some way, but I ain't gonna do that because I like everything to be the same all the time. I love these this pickup configuration because I can always make it sound like I want it to. I don't care, even if, even on a passive bass, it always sounds the same, right? You just like, you roll, it just makes it a little bit more round to roll a little bit of that, that jank in there, um, the, the, the jazz bass pickup. And, um, you know, but, it, but I tend to run it mostly on the P bass. Uh, you know, as you can see, like right here, this is a, this knob, like up, up the middle, you know, then it's both. And then you do it like that and it's more on the P bass. And uh, you know, the, the, like just the jazz bass just sounds like butt, I mean, it's terrible. Like, uh, but, <laughs> but you put it, put it like that and it sounds pretty good. Um, I mean, because it ain't really a jazz bass, right? Like that's dumb, like a jazz bass got two of these things, right? And you can make a jazz bass sound like a P bass, right? Like if you, uh, but I don't think you can make a P bass sound like a jazz bass, like maybe, you know, kind of. Um, I don't know, I might be wrong about that. I'm not an authority on these things. So anyway, that's the steak base, that's the story of the steak base. Take in the photo 